exploring how we can master ourselves by looking at how authors and experts say it is possible with your host, Shashiti Basu. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 97 of How to Be, with me, Shashiti, as your timid presenter, guiding you through life's tricky topics and skills by reading through the best books out there. There are countless examples of injustices caused by inequitable global systems, from climate-induced migration to uneven access to healthcare to plagues of locusts causing food insecurity. What we realise is that these are not different patterns of injustice that resemble one another. Rather, climate justice, social justice and racial justice are all one and the same. Intersectionality highlights the fact that climate change does not affect everyone equally. Climate change disproportionately affects certain marginalised and vulnerable groups, and when different types of discrimination overlap, the impact can be compounded. So how do we look at climate change with an intersectional lens? Our first book is from Leah Thomas, who is an eco-communicator, i.e. an environmentalist with a love for writing and creativity, based in California. She's passionate about advocating for and exploring the relationship between social justice and environmentalism. She first wrote about intersectional environmentalism in 2019, but gained international following after her post, Environmentalists for Black Lives Matter, in 2020. She has written for Vogue and Elle, among other places, and has been featured in Harper's Bazaar, W Magazine, Domino, Glamour, Teen Vogue, and on numerous podcasts. She studied environmental science and worked for the U.S. National Park Service in Patagonia before becoming a full-time activist, the intersectional environmentalist, How to Dismantle Systems of Oppression to Protect People and Planet, is her first book. It was so fantastic speaking with her. Hence, here's a snippet of our chat. But find the full interview on www.howtobe247.com or on the YouTube channel. Yeah, it's really interesting. It wasn't intentional by any means. I think just existing as a woman of color and a black woman in the space, it just started to become really apparent. I studied environmental science and policy when I was in school. And to be honest, it was a very white program. There weren't a lot of people who looked like me in that program. And I naturally just started gravitating to projects that had to do with people of color and our relationship with the environment around us because I was just really interested in that. And also when I started studying, this is when the Black Lives Matter movement kind of began in the United States. So around 2014, 2015, um, there was an incident in Ferguson that happened in my hometown that sparked the Black Lives Matter movement in many ways. So when I was in school, I was also thinking about back home. So I think that's why I started making the connection. And then I just got so shocked in my classroom when I kept seeing, oh my goodness, people of color, not just here, but globally are experiencing the brunt of the climate crisis and environmental injustice. And there are a lot of organizations that are treating this like an optional add-on to environmentalism. So that's why I just wanted to find any way I could write about it, talk about it, increase awareness about environmental justice and more intersectional approaches to environmentalism and the people who have been doing that for a long time, because there's a ton of people out there that have been trying to make noise about these intersections. And it feels like now is the time for it, which is really exciting. And I think when people think of the environment because of so many documentaries about you know, men going out into the wilderness and summiting mountains or like doing whatever they do in the woods. I think people start to think that's what environmentalism looks like or specifically conservation. Uh, people are really familiar with, you know, organizations like WWF, which is now shifting to care more about, you know, climate justice. But that's their reference point when we're talking about environmentalism, animals, trees, wilderness spaces. And I think we've just gotten really far away from being able to reconcile with the fact that we are in nature every day. So even though we are in these homes um, and we might not be off in the wilderness, some of us are, we're still interacting with nature each and every day. And because we are in nature and our communities are ecosystems, then racism and other systemic inequalities will interact with our natural environment. 
So I would say it's not the most straightforward thing for folks, but once I explain it to people, a lot of people are like, oh yeah, that totally makes sense. Yeah, so if you have privilege, and there's different types of privilege, but wealth, for example, if you live in a wealthier area, you're more likely to be exposed to nature in your own neighborhood and then outside of your neighborhood. So median income is connected to how many trees are in your neighborhood, how many parks are in your neighborhood, how clean and healthy your water and air is. So if that's your everyday reality and you're walking outside and you're like, well, I always have access to parks, you know, everyone probably lives like this. And then even the ability to pay for vacations to go out into the wilderness or national parks and kind of create that relationship and not understanding that that's something that not everyone can have. So if that's a privilege that you have, it can be really easy to think that everyone else has that same access to nature and hard to comprehend that that's not the case for everyone. Some people don't have enough trees in their neighborhoods to purify the air or struggling with, you know, different inequalities with air and water pollution. Um, So that's one thing. And I think racial justice is also really important here with privilege, because if you uh, are of a more privileged identity that is not presently being impacted by climate injustice, as many communities of color are in the present, then you have the privilege to think about the future in other ways that people can't now. So you might be dismissive if you're not well informed about environmental justice and say, well, if we don't get this carbon out of the atmosphere 50 years from now, my grandchildren won't have a home instead of thinking, "Okay, but there are people now whose homes are being, you know, swept away by sea level rise or all of these sorts of things. So privilege allows you to exist in future thinking in ways that people who are currently struggling with day-to-day, the day-to-day realities of environmental injustice aren't able to do in the same way. Yeah, I think sometimes it is, you know, really intentional and sometimes maybe it's not as intentional, but people know what they can get away with. Um, if there was unclean water in Orange County, California that had lead in their water, I think city officials know very well that they would be sued, there would be litigation, there would be a huge controversy and national attention. So I think, unfortunately, when people view communities as not having power to rise up, all sorts of decisions are made that impact people's health and safety. Yeah, this is another one that sometimes is hard to for people to wrap their heads around. Um, But access to healthy food and produce also varies by income and oftentimes race. It looks different in different demographics. Um, So, for example, there are places that struggle with food apartheid where they might not have grocery stores within a reasonable radius. So that's something that's happening in indigenous communities in Alaska and the United States because they live so far away from infrastructure or when they finally do get, you know, fresh food and produce, it's marked up where we're seeing strawberries cost $20 instead of the normal like five to however much it's supposed to cost. So having lack of access to clean, healthy food is a food justice issue. So whether you're in a remote area or even in urban and suburban areas that are lower income, You'll see an increase in fast food restaurants, liquor stores, and things like that, and lack of access to sometimes just straight up grocery stores that have healthy food and produce. So that contributes, that poor city planning um, contributes to negative health impacts and is also an environmental justice issue because, I don't know, having organic food that's not overly processed is also better for the environment and better for our health. Um, So that's one of many things, uh, I guess, that has to do with food apartheid. I would say that it's in the present. I think a lot of sustainability messaging or climate change messaging in particular was focusing on a future and what it could look like and not enough of a focus of the present. Um, So even when I was just in Nepal like two weeks ago, and was connecting to farmers who were saying normally for like centuries we've had rain during this time of the year and this time of the year and even the shift of like a month off of that is devastating to farmers 
Um, so even those like subtle changes that a lot of folks, especially in the global north, aren't thinking about, it's impacting farmers right now. And then even just talking to them like, yeah, this increased unusual rainfall led to this hill literally falling down or having they had like 200 micro emergencies, which are essentially just like floods that might wipe out, you know, a couple houses down the hill. So I think it's important for people to know that these things are happening right now and people are trying to, in their own way, you know, combat these issues. So they were planting bamboo and sugarcane because of the increased floods, because one, they need to make a profit and they need to sell a crop. And two, because those two plants like suck up a lot of water and can help prevent flood and landslide. So I think when I saw that up close and personal, it's like the climate crisis is here. That shift of rainfall is significant. An increase in temperature or even things that we feel when we walk outside in the summer and it's cold and we're like, "Eh, that's a weird day. It's more than just a real day and it's happening right now. So I think that's something I'd like for people to understand that this is a crisis of the present for many people around the globe. In Intersectional Environmentalist, The author reflects on her upbringing influenced by her grandmother, a farmer and descendant of enslaved Americans. She emphasizes the values of dignity, community and love instilled in her by strong black women who practiced conservation and sustainable living as a way of life. The book advocates for intersectional environmentalism, emphasizing that tackling climate change requires addressing racial, gender and class inequalities. It highlights the importance of uplifting marginalized voices in the environmental movement and showcases stories of grassroots organizers, particularly women of color, making a positive impact. She encourages readers to be part of creating a more just and sustainable future. In Intersectional Environmentalist, she passionately advocates for the fusion of social justice and environmentalism. She emphasizes the interconnectedness of protecting the planet and safeguarding the rights and well-being of marginalized communities. The author laments the historical separation of social issues from environmentalism, especially in predominantly white educational institutions. She narrates a journey of realizing the disparity in environmental representation and how her identity as a black woman influenced her perspective on sustainability. The book discusses the need for a more inclusive and diverse environmental movement, highlighting the impact of environmental injustice on communities of colour. The author recalls her experiences during the Black Lives Matter movement and her frustration with the lack of acknowledgement and support from the wider environmental community. She introduces the concept of intersectional environmentalism, highlighting its priority of addressing both social justice and environmental concerns. The author's creation of a viral graphic advocating environmentalists for Black Lives Matter and a pledge for intersectional environmentalism led to a grassroots movement. It garnered widespread support from individuals and major environmental organizations, sparking a global conversation about the importance of inclusivity in environmental advocacy. Hence, Thomas envisions a future where environmentalism automatically includes a deep concern for both people and the planet, eliminating the need for the term intersectional. She believes that by uniting and amplifying the voices of marginalized communities, a more equitable and sustainable world can be achieved. She discusses the concept of intersectionality and its evolution in the context of environmentalism. It emphasizes the importance of recognizing that intersectionality originated from the experiences and struggles of black women particularly Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, who developed the theory to address the unique challenges faced by black women. Thomas also highlights the need to honour and protect the origins of intersectionality and not dilute its significance. She delves into the historical divisions within the feminist movement, noting that early feminist movements often neglected issues of racial equality within the struggle for women's rights. The book emphasises the emergence of black feminism, which advocated for both racial and gender equality during the civil rights and women's rights movements. This led to the development of intersectional theory by Crenshaw in 1989. The concept of misogynoir, a specific form of sexism faced by black women, is discussed, along with examples of racial disparities, stereotypes 
and double standards that black women encounter. This highlights the importance of recognising and addressing the discrimination faced by black women. The Combahee River Collective, founded in 1974, is introduced as a group of black feminists who sought to combat capitalism, racism, homophobia, sexism and other forms of oppression. They argued that the liberation of black women would result in freedom for all people and emphasised the need for intersectional approaches to social justice. She then shifts to Crenshaw's contribution, particularly her work in critical race theory and the development of intersectionality. Crenshaw's research exposed instances of structural inequality and the unique experiences of black women in the legal system. The concept of intersectionality is defined as the complex way in which multiple forms of discrimination, such as racism, sexism and classism, intersects and compounds the experiences of marginalised individuals or groups. Crenshaw's work highlighted the need to consider all aspects of a person's identity, not just one, when addressing discrimination and inequality. The author also explores the origins of ecofeminism, a framework that examines the connection between the oppression of women and the degradation of the environment, discusses how Early creation theories and cultural beliefs have influenced the perception of women's relationship with nature. As a result, Thomas calls for the validation of indigenous wisdom and the inclusion of all voices in the environmental movement. Intersectionality therefore provides a framework for achieving environmental justice, which aims to ensure fair treatment for all people regardless of their identity in relation to the environment. Concepts like climate justice, Intersexual environmentalism and environmentalism all contribute to the quest for environmental liberation. Knowledge plays a vital role in building a more equitable future, involving reflection, historical analysis and reshaping environmental education to be holistic and representative. Environmental justice emphasises fair treatment and meaningful participation in environmental decisions for everyone, regardless of race, colour, national origin or income. It emerged in the 1980s spurred by the civil rights and Earth Day movements. Hazel M. Johnson, a black environmental activist, exposed environmental hazards disproportionately affecting communities of colour, advocating for recognition of systemic racism's health and environmental impacts. Dr. Robert Bullard, often called the father of environmental justice, conducted research revealing the racial disparities in toxic waste site placements. His work led to the recognition that black communities in the southern United States were targeted for hazardous facilities. Bullard's advocacy efforts culminated in the creation of the 17 Principles of Environmental Justice in 1991. Environmental liberation, a term coined by Generation Green, seeks to unite black liberation, climate justice, and environmental justice. It examines environmental injustices stemming from colonialism, racial capitalism, and white supremacy. Environmental liberation aims to empower black communities to thrive in their environments by challenging oppressive systems and promoting equity. The legacies of trailblazers like Johnson and Dr. Bullard inspire efforts to reshape environmental education and promote environmental liberation for marginalised communities. The environmental and environmental justice movements owe a debt of gratitude to the civil rights movements, led by black, indigenous, Latinx, Pacific Islander, people of colour and Asian communities. These civil rights movements fought against discrimination, advocating for equal access to a safe and healthy life, encompassing racial, economic, health and environmental equality. In the 1960s, as they battled racial segregation and discrimination, they also raised awareness about environmental and public health issues affecting their communities. In 1968, black sanitation workers in Memphis protested unsafe conditions and inadequate pay, marking an intersection of health, environmental, racial and economic justice. Indigenous activists occupied Alcatraz Island in 1969, demanding its return to indigenous peoples and restorative justice. These early events laid the foundation for intersectional environmentalism. At the same time, 
1970 Earth Day movement, inspired by civil rights activism, was predominantly white-led and attended. This exclusion of underrepresented voices led to the emergence of the environmental justice movement in the 1980s. Legislation passed during this period aimed to rectify these injustices. Today, social justice and environmental advocacy movements, such as Black Lives Matter, Land Back, Stop Asian Hate and climate activism are gaining momentum. An intersectional approach that unites social and environmental justice causes could be a powerful force as separating them weakens both movements. Understanding that climate justice and social justice are intertwined is crucial for addressing the interconnected challenges we face. Conversations about race, culture, religion, gender identity and sexuality are increasingly common, but some people avoid them due to fear of discomfort and conflict. However, these discussions are essential to understanding how identities relate to privileges and prejudices. Ignoring differences doesn't stop discrimination or create change. Privilege encompasses unearned advantages based on one's identity, influenced by societal perceptions and biases. These biases result from cultural norms, media and society, causing certain identity aspects to be favoured leading to power imbalances known as privilege. The big eight identities include age, ability, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status and religion. Social constructs are beliefs assigned meaning and value within society, such as the idea of race. Unearned societal advantages were discussed by W.E.B. Dubois, who introduced the concept of psychological wage for white Americans. Peggy McIntosh later detailed white privilege. Systemic disparities exist across various identity aspects. The wage gap, limited upward mobility, unequal education, housing discrimination, and disparities in criminal justice disproportionately affect marginalised groups. These inequalities persist despite changing demographics in the US. The Horatio Alger myth Emphasising hard work alone as the path to success neglects privilege, systemic oppression and prejudice. It can lead to victim blaming and stereotypes about those facing barriers. Recognising privilege doesn't make someone a bad person. It's about understanding how advantages are tied to identity aspects and then advocating for equity. Allies should listen, especially to BIPOC and marginalised communities, to address injustices and biases. Privilege intersects with environmentalism as those with more power are less exposed to environmental hazards. Communities of colour often face environmental injustice, receive fewer resources and experience disparities in housing, pollution exposure and disaster recovery. Living sustainably can also be a privilege as certain practices are more accessible. Accessibility and disability issues are often overlooked in sustainability discussions, but they intersect with environmentalism. Allies should acknowledge privilege, fight eco-ableism, and advocate for accessible sustainability. It's crucial to recognise that ignoring privilege is a privilege in itself. The environmental justice crisis has had severe and lasting impacts on people of colour worldwide. For example, black Americans constituting 13.3% of the US population in 2016 have a history intertwined with slavery, Jim Crow laws and redlining, which have led to present-day social health and environmental inequalities. They suffer from poor air quality, extreme heat and higher rates of asthma due to their proximity to environmental hazards. Latinx Americans representing 17.8% of the population in the same year have faced systemic discrimination in immigration, healthcare, education and employment. They often live in heat islands, areas with limited green spaces, leading to higher temperatures and are exposed to air pollution, food insecurity and pesticide use. 
Indigenous communities, numbering 5.2 million in the 2010 U.S. Census, have experienced historical injustices and continue to face challenges like poor air quality, food scarcity, limited access to clean water and displacement. AAPI communities, comprising 7% of the U.S. population in 2019, have a diverse background with roots in various Asian countries. Discrimination against Asians dates back to the California gold rush and continued with anti-Asian sentiments during and after World War II. They face health risks from air pollution as well, limited access to green spaces and the effects of sea level rise in places like Hawaii. Globally, environmental injustice transcends borders. The disposal of waste from the global north to the global south such as e-waste in China, poses health and environmental risks. The impact of climate change in countries like Uganda, the Philippines and low-lying island nations is severe, yet often overlooked by the Western climate movement. These injustices are not isolated. They are interconnected with systemic issues like racism, capitalism and colonialism. Highlighting and addressing these issues is crucial for achieving environmental justice and fostering a more equitable world. The author emphasises the interconnectedness of human actions with the planet and how choices related to fashion, renewable energy and veganism impact both people and the environment, i.e. or intersectional environmentalism, promotes considering all voices in environmental discussions and advocating for both social and environmental justice. The fashion industry, particularly fast fashion, is highlighted as a major contributor to environmental problems due to its high carbon emissions, waste production, and promotion of excessive consumption. The shift towards fast fashion has led to disposable clothing, worsening landfills, and even changing how our brains perceive pleasure through shopping. The negative environmental impacts of the fashion industry are outlined, including excessive consumption, textile emissions, water usage and human rights violations. These issues call for a shift towards sustainable, ethical and slow fashion practices, although accessibility and affordability remain significant challenges. The book also delves into the realm of renewable energy, emphasising its importance in reducing environmental harm. However, it raises concerns about the disregard for indigenous communities affected by green energy projects, such as biomass energy in Thailand and wind energy in Mexico. She highlights where these projects have led to environmental damage, displacement and violence against indigenous populations. Lithium mining, crucial for batteries used in green technology, is explored with a focus on its negative impact on indigenous communities in South America. While green energy is vital, it should not come at the expense of marginalised communities and projects must prioritise their well-being. She then discusses the environmental benefits of plant-based diets, such as reducing carbon footprints and farmland use. However, It raises the issue of a lack of representation of people of colour in the mainstream vegan movement and calls for recognition of the historical and cultural roots of plant-based diets among diverse communities. Our final book is from Michaela Loach, who was named in Forbes 2020 as one of the most influential women in the UK climate movement. The 25-year-old powerhouse was a fourth-year medical student at the time of writing her book, It's Not That Radical, Climate Action to Transform Our World. She also holds a degree in global health policy. An influential climate activist, Loach is on a mission to inform the masses through her focus on the climate crises and its intersections of anti-racism, feminism, ethical fashion, wealth inequality and refugee rights. Here she is speaking to Lush. Most recently, um, I have written this book um, called It's Not That Radical, Climate Action to Transform Our World. It's about this kind of duality that what we're asking for, the fact that everyone should be safe, the fact that everyone should be housed, the fact that everyone should be able to live in dignity and have joy. um, Those are not ridiculous asks. Those are not extreme asks. Those are not outrageous asks. 
And yet in the mainstream media, often um, achieving those things is presented as this ridiculous, outrageous um, or extreme ask. And instead, those who are kind of pushing through new oil and gas fields, those companies that um, are extracting huge amounts of wealth from their workers and from their supply chains are seen as the norm. And I think we really need to reframe what is um, seen as radical in that sense. And and also understand, though, that to get to um, transforming our world, we have to go to the roots of these issues. And so in a sense, it, it is that radical um, to, to transform our world. So what is climate justice? In reality, it's a framework which understands how the climate crisis impacts people is dependent upon systems of oppression. So people are not impacted equally by the climate crisis. The climate crisis is often talked about as this kind of great equalizer, but in actual fact, it's the great multiplier. It multiplies and makes worse the existing ways that people experience oppression and marginalization and inequity in our world. So for example, um, humans in poorer countries are five times more likely than those in richer countries to be displaced by sudden, sudden extreme weather events. And even in that, we have to interrogate um, the even terminology of poorer countries or richer countries. As Michael Prenti says, um, countries are not poor, they are overexploited. Um, and countries are not rich, they exploit from other countries to become rich. So climate justice shows us that we might be in the same storm, but we are most definitely not in the same boat. Um, some people and some communities are in a huge kind of stormproof ocean liners um, and, and others are in unseaworthy rafts and the reason that those kind of stormproof ocean liners have been able to to grow that big and to um, to fortify themselves in that way is because they have taken those resources from the people who are forced into unseaworthy rafts it's not that radical is a book aimed at those who have felt overwhelmed anxious or powerless in the face of the climate crisis loach reassures readers that this is not a defeatist book Instead, it's a source of active hope that can transform feelings of anxiety and fear into action. The central message is that we have the power to create a better world by reframing our understanding of the climate crisis and the systems that caused it. The book challenges the paralysing fear and pessimism often associated with climate narratives. Loach argues that fear is a divisive force that we must unite to address the climate crisis effectively. She explores climate justice and environmental activism, emphasising the interconnectedness of climate change with oppressive systems like white supremacy, capitalism and patriarchy. Loach encourages readers to take meaningful action and dismantle these systems to create a better world. She highlights the importance of language and collective action, emphasising that it's never too late to make a difference. The book then delves into the concept of climate justice, emphasising that the climate crisis amplifies existing inequalities. Vulnerable communities, particularly those in poorer countries and marginalised groups, bear the brunt of its consequences. Loach argues that addressing the climate crisis can lead to broader improvements in health, gender liberation and the dismantling of oppressive systems. Loach challenges the conventional narrative that places collective responsibility for the climate crisis on humanity as a whole. Instead, she points the finger at the wealthy elite, fossil fuel CEOs, and PR firms promoting greenwashing and climate denial. She highlights the disproportionate carbon footprint of the global north and the historical emissions of Western countries, underscoring the need for systemic change. The book introduces the concept of atmospheric colonialism, emphasising that addressing climate change requires more than individual guilt. It demands government intervention and systemic transformation. Loach advocates for policies that promote sustainable choices and reduce carbon-intensive practices, while addressing the exploitation and oppression rooted in colonialism and capitalism. The importance of adaptation, mitigation and loss and damage in addressing the climate crisis is stressed. Loach calls for the global North nations and corporations to take responsibility and fund adaptation efforts in vulnerable regions, emphasising the need for reparations to address climate harm disproportionately caused by the global North. Debt cancellation for affected nations is seen as a crucial step in enabling their transition to renewable energy and infrastructure. She debunks the overpopulation argument as a cause of climate change putting the blame on overconsumption and capitalism. She condemns eco-fascism, an ideology rooted in white supremacy and environmentalism, and advocates for collective action and transformative change. 
The book highlights the intersection of climate change, white supremacy and environmental justice, exposing the deliberate delay in addressing climate change driven by profit motives and white supremacy. Loach argues that climate inaction is a form of violence perpetrated by capitalism, imperialism and the sacrifice of marginalised communities. She urges readers to move beyond white environmentalism and confront root causes of environmental issues. She emphasises the importance of creating safe spaces for marginalised communities, collective liberation and dismantling oppressive systems. The book critiques false solutions like carbon offsets and electric vehicles, emphasising their negative impacts on indigenous communities and the environment. She rejects apocalyptic narratives and champions collective action and unity. The book underscores the role of active citizens in effecting change, criticising consumerism and highlighting the need to dismantle oppressive systems like white supremacy, colonialism and racism. Boach argues that capitalism fosters false scarcity and promotes excessive consumption, resulting in environmental degradation and social inequality. To address these issues, Loach advocates for a climate justice-based economy that prioritises human needs, well-being and interconnectedness over profit. She introduces the concept of degrowth, which seeks to reduce consumption in wealthier nations while transitioning to a sustainable world. A study referenced by Loach suggests that a 60% reduction in energy consumption by 2050 is achievable without compromising the quality of life. The author calls for the adoption of eco-socialism and highlights Bolivia's efforts to combine socialism with environmental protection. She emphasises the need for a climate movement that offers hope and tangible improvements in people's lives, all while challenging the prevailing systems of capitalism and advocating for workers' rights and global solidarity. Loach also discusses the importance of anger and activism against fossil fuel companies, shedding light on the deceptive practices of the industry. She highlights the value of direct action, protests and divestment to challenge the power and influence of these companies. The author stresses the insignificance of diverse roles within the climate movement, encouraging individuals to contribute in their unique ways. Furthermore, the book explores the essence of radical activism and the importance of avoiding the replication of oppressive structures in the fight for change. Loach draws inspiration from Audre Lorde's emphasis on intersectionality and community building in activism. She advocates for a strategic approach to activism, employing various tactics, including non-reformist reform, to challenge existing systems. The power of storytelling and effective communication through language is underscored. Loach encourages individuals to take actions of varying scales, highlighting that every step toward change matters. She emphasises the need for bravery and love in the pursuit of a transformed and liberated world. The author also addresses the tendency to label and judge others based on their beliefs, emphasising the importance of allowing space for personal transformation. Loach urges constructive dialogue and empathy, acknowledging that not everyone has had equal access to education and resources. She also challenges oversimplified binaries and advocates for recognising the complexity of individuals, even historical figures with mixed legacies. Loach believes that embracing the complexity of people can lead to transformative change and calls for an end to the pursuit of perfectionism in a world shaped by capitalist and white supremacist systems. Loach introduces Jess Malley's Healthy Humans framework, which highlights the significance of recognising one's inherent worth as a foundation for unlearning and activism. She stresses the need to change the common ground in society, shaping how people act in their daily lives. Loach critiques cancel culture and calls for accountability without punishment. She encourages embracing discomfort as an integral part of personal and societal change, emphasising the importance of joining movements and organising for a liberated future. The book also shares the author's experiences during a pivotal election in Colombia, highlighting the stark differences between two black female candidates, Francia Marquez and Marilyn Castillo. Bloch critiques the tendency to equate identity with progress and discusses the origins of identity politics, emphasising the need to challenge co-opted versions that focus on surface-level representation rather than addressing oppressive systems. 
The pitfalls of cosmetic inclusion are scrutinised in various contexts, including social media and politics. Loach critiques the elevation of politicians who may not align with the well-being of marginalised communities as signs of progress. She warns against elite capture, where privileged individuals in power divert resources and institutions for their interests. Ultimately, Loach calls for a meaningful diversity that genuinely represents historically excluded voices and fosters collective strength through a diversity of ideas, tactics and skills. The author also stresses that true change arises from collective movements made up of ordinary individuals. Loach highlights the negative impact of individualism promoted by capitalism and neoliberalism, emphasising the importance of community, solidarity and collaboration to address various issues, including climate justice. Loach acknowledges the complexities of gaining a growing social media platform and the challenges of being put on a pedestal. She challenges the notion of idolising activists, advocating for a collective approach where power is distributed among many. The author underscores the significance of each contribution to a cause, regardless of its scale, and highlights the importance of building relationships within activist communities for long-term sustainability. In conclusion, the book encourages empathy, complexity and a commitment to dismantling oppressive systems while fostering hope for a transformed and liberated world in the face of urgent climate change. So to sum up, in The Intersectional Feminist, Thomas emphasises the power of amplifying diverse climate leaders' messages and not remaining silent in the face of pivotal moments impacting marginalised communities. Amplification creates a ripple effect, raising awareness and driving action. Each individual's actions can lead to systemic change and everyone has a role in activism, regardless of their unique skills. The future of environmentalism is intersectional, requiring collective action to transform the world and promote a greener, more equitable future. While in It's Not That Radical, Loach acknowledges the fear and despair often associated with climate change, but emphasises that hope, rooted in evidence from past social movements and the active pursuit of climate justice, can motivate change. She encourages readers to harness both anger and hope, recognising that hope must be a verb, driving proactive change. Ultimately, Loach inspires readers to engage in climate activism while maintaining personal well-being and joy, urging them to imagine and fight for a better, liberated world. I can see the devastating impact climate has had on places I've lived around the world, including India and China. The pollution is utterly stifling, and it's the people who are the most destitute who are in the front line of living with the effects of it. What do you think? How can you be an intersectional environmentalist? Let us know. Please join in on the conversation by following at How to Be 24 7 on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and subscribe to the podcast, which can be found via www.howtobe247.com We have Spotify polls, so feel free to send your responses there too. You can even check out all our exclusive unseen bonus material from every single interview or for a price of a coffee on both Spotify and Patreon under the name Behind the Scenes, exclusive from the How To Be Books podcast. All the latest ones are on Spotify, while more than 30 exclusives are on Patreon. We've also launched a shop on Patreon where you can buy one-off exclusives. Sign up to be part of the movement. Please do leave a review if you found this helpful and you want to be featured. And remember to check out the website. We had our first ever guest post from Dr Robin Stern on gaslighting. We also asked the experts about book clubs and whether there's still a thing. And we were at the Henley Literary Festival, so check out our exclusives there. See you in two weeks' time.